patients of COVID-19 series. I'm Hal Ali, the coordinator of Easter Alliance for Global Health Partnerships. These webinars take place on Fridays at 12 p.m. GMT. And every week we host experts from health, from the healthcare and global health fields to discuss with us various aspects of the COVID-19 pandemic. This webinar is the 12th in the series, and today's topic is the positive power of communities in the response to COVID-19. A recording of this webinar will be available later on our website and YouTube channels shown on the screen, Irish Global Health Network and Easter Alliance for Global Health Partnerships. Live streaming is also available right now on our YouTube channel, Irish Global Health Network. If you have any questions during the webinar, please use the question and answer feature in the bottom of the screen. For now, I will leave you with my co-host, Nadine Fers france the Executive Director of Irish Global Health Network. Nadine? Thanks, Hala, and um, welcome, everybody. I'm really excited for today's webinar, as it's a, a webinar, a, a subject very close to my own heart, um, focusing on communities. I'm also really, really delighted to welcome some very good friends of mine and, and people who are very well known to, to communities around the world. Uh, starting with uh, Nicola Willis. Uh, Nicola is the founder and the executive director of Africaid's Jandiri program in Zimbabwe. She's trained as a pediatric and adolescent HIV nurse, first in the UK, before she worked in Ghana, South Africa, Kenya, and then has lived and worked in Zimbabwe since 2004. Um, with Jandiri, she has been with her team assisting government and health facilities and communities to establish pediatric and adolescent HIV treatment care and support services, which are really, really phenomenal. And I'm really excited that we get a chance for everybody to learn more about them. So welcome, Nicola. Um, also delighted to have uh, Florence Martin Bohr with us. She's from Kenya. She's in Kenya today. She's the coordinator of the Brighter Communities Worldwide in Kenya. She's a member also of the West of Ireland Kenyan Steering Group Committee. So this coordinates and we're very familiar with this um, incredible partnership between Londiani Subdistrict Hospital, the Department of Health in Karacha County in Kenya, Mayo University Hospital in Castle Bar in Ireland, Kenyatta University, and also NUIG in Galway in Ireland. So very, very welcome, Florence. And we Thank will you. Uh, welcome. Uh, we are also delighted to introduce, she'll be joining us hopefully very soon, uh, Wine Kwat. She is a medical doctor and uh, founder and executive director of the Centre for, for, the Center for Supporting Community Development Initiatives, SCDI. No stranger to Ireland, uh, Wine was here as a keynote speaker for the Father Michael Kelly lecture on HIV AIDS in 2018. Um, SCDI, as many people will know, it's a Vietnamese organization, an NGO, and they focus on improving the lives of marginalized populations through community empowerment. And they work, they particularly serve um, marginalized groups, sex workers, drug users, people living with HIV, transgender people, and, and many others. Um, Wine has also got experience, vast experience. She's the chair of APCASO, the Asia Pacific Coalition of, of Aid Service Organizations, and she's the civil society society representative on the UHC 2030 steering committee, Universal Health Coverage Steering Committee. Um, last but not least, and uh, delighted to welcome um, Blessina Kumar from India to Ireland also today. Uh, she is the CEO of the Global Coalition of TB Activists, the first and the only global network of people affected by TB. And many people will know GCTA is at the forefront of advocacy and capacity, capacity building for advocates and activists around the world. And their mission is to change the status quo for TB. She's also founder, co-founder of Touched by TB, which is the national coalition in India of people affected by TB. So an amazing lineup of speakers and experiences to share today. Uh, first, and I want to go over to Rory Brewer, Professor Rory Brewer, our webinar anchor, who is former head of the Department of Epidemiology and Public Health in the Royal College of Surgeons. So thanks for kicking us off, Rory. Great. So I don't know if you can let me know, can you see my screen? Not yet. Um, Ellen, is the screen, do I need to share again? I think you'll need to share there again, yeah. Sorry, where are we? This, this always happens and then we give up and uh, go back to Ellen, who's um, <laughs> probably a lot, a lot more reliable at these things. It could be, Rory, could be. 
Uh, okay, I'm just sharing screen again. Okay, is it coming in this time? Yep, we're looking at, yep. Perfect. Okay, and, uh, okay, can you see this first slide there? Yes. So those of you who have um, been listening in in these webinars over the, uh, over the several weeks now, um, we just start off with a global overview. And what I put there on the front page at the bottom was uh, just a number of cases, uh, cumulative cases, deaths, but also those recovered. And I think it's important to, to realize while many people are ill, at least half of the cases have actually recovered now. But when I, I, I put those, uh, I put figures up this morning and I just um, uh, corrected them now. So since uh, this morning, um, there were 34,000 new cases and 362 deaths. So it's a, it's a, it's a very much a live pandemic. And uh, uh, last week, you'll recall, uh, I showed a slide like this with um, uh, a number of the, the countries. And uh, we were looking at low and middle income countries and the impact of uh, COVID-19 on, on the health systems. And uh, Brazil is a, a high middle income, India, low middle income country. So what we've shown here is actually just the trajectory over the last week. And we've uh, included a, uh, just a, sh a, a shorter selection of countries, including those represented on the panel today. And uh, what we can see is uh, just the scale of the, the pandemic in, in Brazil. We've seen uh, 177,000 cases over the last week. That's new cases. Uh, 40, that's a 40% increase and 7,275 deaths. The, the scale of the pandemic in India is similar, just a 36% rise in cases, almost 60,000 new cases in the last week. And, and South Africa, while we're looking at lower numbers of cases reported, there's 49% increase in cases. So it tells us something about the stage of the pandemic in these, in these countries, where they're really, uh, it's at its worst, uh, and it may not even have reached its peak yet in Brazil, which is what, which is the appalling tragedy of, of appalling leadership and, and, and what the result of that is. When we look at uh, the other countries there, we see pr probably an earlier stage of the, the pandemic in Kenya and Zimbabwe, Vietnam. Now that's really notable. I'm gonna say a little bit about that in a couple of minutes. One case since last week, uh, no deaths at any stage. And then at the bottom, we have Ireland, where there's been a 1% increase over the last week. So I was trying to think, because I, I, the people on the, uh, on the panel here are really are the experts in this area, but I decided just to go back into my own history uh, to look at some, what, what are the, some of the seminal um, events. And, and I started working in Africa five years after the Alma'ata a declaration. Um, and I think what uh, you can see the, a definition there of the principles of Alma-Ata, what it was achieve, trying to achieve. But what was notable, I remember readings many years ago, was that it was really the work of NGOs uh, and faith-based organizations and the initiatives that they had been running for several years. That is what was brought together at Alma-Ata. And while it was representatives of governments from 60 countries, the NGOs, the FBOs, the different community initiatives were all uh, represented there, meeting on the periphery. And when I went to Ghana in 83, it was very much implementing and trying out these primary healthcare approaches. Second uh, initiative I put up there, uh, because I came across it in the 80s, and I think this was developed particularly in Kenya, um, which is using the uh, adapting Paolo Freire's pedagogy of the oppressed principles for working with communities. And what I thought was interesting there, those are the chapter titles, and they would be so relevant today, not only to COVID-19, but to what we're seeing happening in the US at the moment. Environment, gender and development, racism, culture, and transforming governance. The next event I've picked on is HIV and AIDS, because uh, I don't think we could have got anywhere uh, towards the successes we achieved in Africa, if, if communities hadn't banged on the door. And I was, I was there in Geneva at some of these meetings, and they had to shout very loud, 
Um, the treatment action campaign is one we would look at, um, but there were many other initiatives and I came across some initiatives in Zambia where uh, women down at the community level were told, you're going to get funding from the World Bank. They started income generating activities for the care of orphans of vulnerable children. The money never came, but the, 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 the initiatives they started were still working five years later. So I think it's, we're really looking forward to hearing today now from the, the panel of speakers about some of the community initiatives which uh, could transform the response to COVID-19. In Ireland, um, we, 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 many of us know the GAA are very much at the centre of every community and, and they have their initiative um, and there are some notable um, initiatives like this community assessment hub. But I thought I would just mention Vietnam because I have one point I want to make today and it's, it's a bit of a challenge to us um, because if you look at, this is the success story which nobody has been talking about. Um, a country of 97 million people, no deaths. These are some of the things they did. They uh, acted very early, you know, closed the, the ports, the airports, quarantine, travel restrictions, lockdown, um, very good communication strategy, rigorous contact tracing. But what I put in bold there is that they made tracking and quarantining of cases mandatory. Uh, and I think that is a challenge to us that it, it, this, is, this was done much more easily in Southeast Asia than I think we would find here. And I think it is, there is a challenge. South Africa, I put up because it's been lauded for its response, uh, its early lockdown. But we talked about this last week and in previous webinars, what, what are the impacts on the urban poor, on food insecurity, on inequities, uh, people not able to go out and, and, and just earn, they need, get the food they need for that day. And I think there are some very good um, uh, community initiatives out there. I just put one link in. So what, finally, what are the conclusions from this? I think we would say the voluntary approaches are preferable to coercive approaches. You can read what uh, I have there in the slide. And um, thanks to um, Foreign Affairs and, and IDS for uh, putting together uh, some information and some links there. Um, maybe the key thing there is about trust and that some of these lockdowns have undermined trust because they've shown no respect for people. And yet in Southeast Asia, trust in the state and allowing the state to be uh, putting draconian measures in place, that is something that actually the people have bought into. And I put an end at the end there, this, this uneasy marriage of trust and coercion because the measures that worked in Southeast Asia they're not working to the same extent elsewhere. And I think we have some very difficult balancing to be done. So I hope I didn't go on too long and I'm really looking forward to um, the um, panel of speakers. Thank you, Nadine. Thank you, Rory. Um, thank you for uh, kicking us off and with, with thinking about trust as well. I think that's an interesting one that's coming up across the webinars. So I would love to um, go straight, if we can, to, uh, to Nicola and to the situation in, uh, in Zimbabwe, because we have heard over previous weeks, um, you know, just the situation with lockdown and what's been happening there. So Nicola, I wonder if you could just describe to us the, you know, what has been happening, what is, what's the situation like at the moment, particularly for communities affected by HIV and particularly for those young people that you're working with every day affected and living with HIV? You're muted, Nicola, just unmute, yeah. Thank you, I'll, I'll eventually get this mute, unmute thing by the end of COVID. <laughs> right, um, so thank you so much for the opportunity to be part of this really exciting uh, webinar. Um, as we've just been hearing, in, in Zimbabwe, there are currently uh, 237 confirmed cases, um, four deaths. Um, so while this is encouraging, there has been a spike in the last few days um, and testing is being rolled out. So we'll see what happens. But as far as we know so far, there have been very, of, the, of those cases, just a very few have been in children and young people. And what we're seeing among young people living with HIV that we're working with is fortunately, we're not yet seeing cases, but we are working with the Ministry of Health as they're rolling out testing to make sure that testing is reaching those young people. We are, however, of course, seeing the, the tremendous impact of COVID on young people. Um, 
definitely around the impact on their mental health, um, arising from social isolation, um, from fears around their health. Will they be able to access the ARVs? Um, difficult decisions, you know, they need to, they know they need to go to clinic for ARVs, um, but they fear, will they, will, of getting COVID when they're moving around. They also fear having to explain why they're moving around um, and do not want to understandably disclose that it's because I've, I'm HIV positive and they need to get my treatment. So that's been a real barrier to them accessing, accessing clinics. Um, they're hungry because ca caregivers don't have the usual household income or access to food. Um, yeah, and they're experiencing increased levels of um, household stress, increased levels of, of GBV. Um, so yes, definitely having, having an impact, uh, but I think, you know, we may well be early days in COVID in Zimbabwe. Yeah, thank you, Nicola. And, you know, just in terms of Jandiri, um, how did you respond? I mean, this is, it's still early days and I know you're still, the response is no doubt changing as you go along, but how has Jandiri responded to make sure that, that the young people and the communities that they're living in are supported? What did your community response look like? And knowing very well that that builds on a very strong community response that's already there. Sure, thanks. Um, definitely, as you've implied, I think it's probably the same for all of us. We're thinking on our feet, it's changing daily, we're learning, we're getting some things right, some things wrong. But um, for those of you that are just a, a bit of a uh, background, we work with a cadre of young people living with HIV, they're 18 to 24 years old, and they work in the communities but also in the clinics to support their peers living with HIV and they provide information, counselling, support, they support them to adhere to the medication, but also looking at other issues of mental health, sexual reproductive health, et cetera. So they do home visits, they see them in the clinics, um, they uh, engage through support groups. Um, and of course, all of these platforms have been very difficult, or impossible, and had to be put on hold um, because of COVID. So what did we do? We, we adapted most of this to a virtual approach of service delivery. So um, cats have, been just phenomenal in, the way, in their commitment and their ability to um, ensuring that they continue to support their peers. So using WhatsApp or SMS or phone calls, they're doing virtual case management. So they continue to track their caseloads, calling them, providing online consultations, um, counseling support, identifying those that are unwell or those that need access to ARVs who are running out of treatment. Um, they screen. Uh, for common mental disorders um, and refer those that are at risk um, and they're looking out for those with any other issues that need additional support. And Nicola can you just tell everybody what are cats? Sorry I meant to say yeah. that thank you cats are not as yeah they're not animals they are young people fabulous young people who are peer supporters um, they are trained and mentored as um, peer counsellors yeah community adolescent treatment supporters thanks Nadine. Um, so the support groups have also gone virtual. Um, we've been talking about this for so long, you know, trying to do more virtual groups um, so we could reach more young people. And I'm sure like many of us, COVID has catapulted us forward with many of these things we've ummed and ahed about for a while. Um, but the e-support groups um, are incredibly popular among young people and they're um, dialing in on, on through WhatsApp. We've also piloted these for caregivers and we, it's wonderful to see uh, grandmothers joining WhatsApp support groups. Um, it, we never thought, we didn't actually think that would work, but they're really, really engaged. And it's such an important part of supporting young people, of course, by remaining engaged with their caregivers. Um, not everybody has, of course, access to phones. So we have a wonderful team of professional uh, social workers, counselors, nurses, who are mentors in the, in the communities, and they move around to follow up on young people with more, who need to be seen at home. So yeah, really it's sort of a switch to a virtual approach, but then enhanced community outreach for those that, are, that really need to be seen and, and are at risk. 
Yeah, and thank you, Nicola. And, and for sure, if Zimbabwe can do it with the situation, not just with data, but also with electricity shortages, then any, any of us can do it. Um, so I, I know that there is such creativity among the cats, among the young people in Jandiri. And I know that because I was, it was my last trip before um, COVID and before lockdown was actually with all of you working on, on stigma there. And I just wonder what creative solutions have you guys, you know, what would you say is, is something that's really creative that, that they came up with, the young people came up with themselves? Yeah. Well, I think you've just said, I mean, it's the young people that uh, they are, they're the creativity in everything we do. And just the, I mean, just, just to highlight their commitment to finding f uh, ways to continue to engage and support young people, not just for HIV and ARVs, but for their mental health. Um, when young people themselves, they're, they're facing just the same issues that we're all facing. And so they have this added work on top. I think I would highlight the information um, and communication work that young people have been, been involved with. So we saw very early on, as we all saw, there was such a barrage of information and we were trying to sift through what, what do you read, what do you not take notice of, or, um, and young people were terrified, of course, and, and very confused. And so I think we, we put a lot of work and time into working with the young people on what information did they need, did they want to, to get and making sure that we developed, um, worked with young people to develop information that was developmentally appropriate, um, that was evidence-based. Normally when we do these sort of videos or animations or materials, you know, we'd get together in a, in a room and work together on content. We'd go off to a recording studio. And of course, none of that was possible, um, but it's incredible what can be done on a phone and from young people, you know, they'd, they'd wait till late in the evening to record their, their um, narratives and their transcripts so that it was ever so quiet and they could get the right quality recordings, et cetera. So yeah, we've developed a series of films um, around COVID, HIV and treatment, and there's more to come. They're available on our website. I think there was a suggestion we may be able to play one of them or part of one of them, but please do get in touch if you need those and they've been translated as well. Yeah. Nicola, thank you so much. And we would love to just show just a short clip of one of those, uh, one of those amazing videos. Hi, it's Fatima. I'm living with HIV and I've been taking ARVs for five years now. I know I must take my ARVs every day if I am to stay healthy and strong. So when I started hearing about the new coronavirus or COVID-19, I started to get really worried. I've heard that social distancing and lockdowns are being put in place to prevent the virus from spreading. That makes sense, but what does this mean to me, my HIV positive status and my ARVs? Will I be able to keep healthy and also go to my clinic for my resupply of medicines? I thought others might have the same concerns, so let me tell you what I've learned from my nurse at the clinic. As COVID-19 is a new virus, we do not know yet how it will affect people living with HIV. But what we do know is that if you do not take your ARVs, HIV will be able to damage your immune system, meaning you are more likely to get infections. It is just as important to take ARVs regularly now as it was before COVID-19. This means you must not run out of medicine. My nurse told me that the health clinics are still open and we should all go for our normal review day. She also said I should try to come early in the morning and some pharmacies close before lunchtime. While sitting on the bus, I made sure to keep one to two meter distance from all the other passengers and to touch as little as possible. Everyone else was doing the same, which made it easier. We all understood it was important to protect each other. I was so aware of not touching my face in case I touched something with COVID-19, then went on to touch my face. When I got off the bus, I made sure to use one of the proper hand sanitizers. Once I got to the clinic, they told us to wait outside as they only wanted to see a few people at a time. We were told to queue one to two meter distance apart. I saw some friends there and practiced greeting them with a wave rather than a hug so that we did not touch each other. It felt a bit strange though, but hey, we all laughed. 
Wow, wonderful. Such a practical example and incredible just to know that that, word, that those videos are being produced by young people for young people. Um, so thank you for that. Um, Nicola, I'm going to thank you. I'm going to leave it there and come back to you if I can um, and come back to you, come back around if I can. Um, okay. Wonderful. So I'm going to move us to Kenya and to Florence then. Um, and we're delighted to have you, Florence, such a strong connection between uh, Kenya and Ireland and, and the partnership you're involved with. We would love to, um, to know just a little bit about what has the impact of um, COVID-19 been on your community health work in Kenya? You might have to unmute yourself. Thank you, Nadine. Okay, so um, Brighter Communities is an uh, NGO working in uh, Kenya since 2002. Our program areas include education, uh, health, and economic empowerment. Our health program has a multifaceted approach, uh, which includes uh, skills, education, uh, awareness, service uh, strengthening, and also infrastructure. And it focuses actually on three levels, the individual and family level, uh, the community level, and then we also have uh, the, bio, uh, the formal biomedical uh, system. So the individual and family level is all about including skills. Uh, it's also about enhancing awareness and capacity development. Uh, the community level is a bottoms up approach uh, which involves training members of the community to be community health uh, volu uh, volunteers and supporting them to uh, improve on the health of their communities. On the formal biomedical system level, this is all about strengthening the health system. And we facilitate a, a partnership between Londiani Sub County Hospital, uh, the Mayo University uh, Hospital, uh, the National University um, of Ireland Galway and Kenyatta University in Nairobi. So as this webinar is about communities, I will primarily focus on communities. Our county of operation is Kericho. It's one of 47 uh, counties in Kenya, and it is home to almost 1 million people. It is predominantly uh, a rural area where about 90% uh, uh, of the population um, are subsistent farmers. Kenya had its first case of COVID-19 uh, on, uh, announced on March the 13th. The government acted swiftly and imposed a curfew. Schools were closed down and there was restricted travel and people were asked to work for home, from home where possible. So for us at Brighter Communities, uh, the priority uh, became the safety of our staff and their families uh, uh, in, in this. So we were trained on COVID-19 uh, before the first case was announced and an incident management system was put in place. We met as a team and we discussed on how we could um, respond to this emergency. Uh, our programs, they still remain relevant, but we had to uh, find a way of delivering them safely. So our 18 years of experience um, and our network across Kericho County, uh, Kericho County is uh, one, of, uh, one of our greatest strengths. So uh, this network includes uh, community health volunteers, it includes um, facilitators, it includes um, teachers amongst others. And so we've leveraged on this network um, to respond to the COVID-19 um, crisis. So to date, we have supported the training of uh, 1,085 uh, people as COVID-19 uh, sensitizers who have now been able to reach uh, 45,000 households across the county, providing soap to the vulnerable, uh, teaching about respiratory um, hygiene, hand washing and um, social distancing. We have also uh, been able to provide 22 town centers and 163 health facilities with, uh, with soap, with uh, hand washing containers, and with also communication material, materials for sensitization. Uh, the pandemic uh, has highlighted the gender gap across the world. 
So we've been working to bridge this gap. Um, for example, our menstrual health program has pivoted to allow girls and women access sanitary products uh, locally in their communities. We are also uh, currently working on the completion of the isolation wards in two um, health facilities. And yesterday we began supporting the training of 400 health um, health healthcare workers across um, our county. COVID-19 has uh, had an impact on the delivery of routine health services uh, in, our in our county. So a few st statistics that I can share, there's been a 39% uh, reduction of the people uh, attending outpatients in, in, in health facilities. We've also seen a 12% reduction of women attending antenatal care and 45% um, 40, uh, reduction of women attending health facilities for postnatal care. And there's also been a 3% uh, reduction in deliveries in health uh, facilities. So that, that, that's, um, that's what in a nutshell we've been able to see. Mm -hmm. Well, wow, Florence, thank you so much for, um, for, for sharing that with us. It's just, it's really striking how the same for, for Kenya and Zimbabwe, how integral your, your NGO, the community response is as part of the health system response. I mean, maybe to ask you, what do you, how do you think that the community response that you've been involved in and initiated has, has actually improved the overall response to, to COVID-19? Okay, we have, um, we have seen a mixed uh, community response. At the very onset, there was a lot of fear in the community, uh, but this was compounded by how the restrictions were enforced in some places, particularly the curfew. Uh, but with the ongoing sensitization, we have actually seen a 66% uh, increase in hand washing and we've, uh, across the households. And we've also noted that the sensitization has helped to alleviate um, the fear because people are now informed. They know at least who to talk to, who else they can go for help. But on the restrictions, you know, the restrictions have been in place for three, three months now and people are slowly reverting back to normal. So for example, markets which had been closed are gradually um, reopening and this is uh, encouraging crowding. Another challenge is the stigma around COVID-19. As a result, uh, the probability of people um, discussing or disclosing COVID-19 related sim symptoms is very, very, very low. And then uh, the other uh, something else that we have also noticed is that the livelihoods for the majority of people in the population have been greatly destabilized. As a result, there's a growing struggle to, um, to make up for lost income and to keep uh, to the government um, restrictions. Additionally, uh, due to the to other weather related um, catastrophes, uh, we've had uh, flooding, we've had um, landslides that have displaced a number of our community members. And so keeping to the COVID-19 measures has become a, second, uh, a secondary priority. With um, the reduced numbers um, attending health facilities, the impact on the communicable diseases such as diabetes and um, hypertension is not as yet um, known. Mm. Well, thank you, Florence. Um, I'm just thinking you mentioned earlier on that there's been a reduction in the amount of people coming to clinics. And I think we've seen that. We've seen it in Ireland. We're seeing it in, in, in all countries affected. Um, how has that affected particularly your work on maternal child health, which I know you, you have been involved in for, for many years together with the, the Mayo General Hospital in Ireland? How has that been affected? Okay, we, we're still in the... We're still in the communities. We're still working in the communities alongside um, the Ministry of Health uh, uh, team. Um, so because we've been working closely with the community health volunteers, they are helping in keeping track uh, with the antenatal care uh, program in, in the households. And also we have um, our outreach uh, programs uh, in areas that are underserved. 
So um, mothers are able to visit these outreach clinics, which are, are ongoing. We've maintained, those have been maintained in the community. So they're monthly. And so we've actually seen a growing, growing numbers more so in the outreach clinics. And I think we're relating that to people avoiding travel, you know, to, their, to other um, health facilities. Yeah. But because of that as well, that has contributed to the um, reduction in the numbers of um, health deliveries. And it will be some time um, for us to, to, to get to see the full impact of, um, of, this, uh, of, of, of the COVID-19 um, changes. Florence, thank you so much. That was so practical and um, so thorough. Gave us a really good picture of, um, of what's happening and what's possible. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to leave it there for, for a moment and move over to Wine in Vietnam, if I can, and um, welcome Wine. Um, if you're able to put on your video, it would be super. We could, we could see you as you speak. Um, there you are. Perfect. Beautiful. Lovely to see you and welcome to Ireland again. <laughs> and you are muted at the moment. Okay. Yeah. Great. Okay. There, you, there you go. And just before you you came on, we were talking about Vietnam, and um, we were just you know just just remarking on how um, COVID nineteen seemed to come under control so quickly, and just wondered if you could describe the situation for us in Vietnam. You know what what kind of impact um, has it had, particularly on vulnerable communities. Um, yeah, so just uh, quickly about the situation in Vietnam. Um, I saw that you shared the link on CNN um, about um, about the, the the control, the success of Vietnam in controlling the uh, COVID nineteen. So um, we have um, by now seven weeks uh, without any community case. Um, so we have no new case in the community. On the there are a couple of new cases that um, diagnosed between. Um, I mean, among the people who returned from abroad and they came um, uh, from the. Uh, evacuation of um, our people, the Vietnamese from other country um, by the charter plane um, and then they would be tested um, at the border and everybody was in quarantine. I mean, if you come enter Vietnam uh, nowadays, you'll be put in quarantine for 14 days um, until you tested uh, negative for three times, then um, you would be, um, you can go home. Um, so we don't have any new case. We have the live, we have a lockdown for three weeks. Um, so the first three weeks of April, um, we are, life is, uh, the lockdown was removed uh, from the 22nd of April. So life is, is back to normal now. The street is very busy. The market are busy. Everything's back. Masa, parlor, and football match and everything. So um, we are back to the traffic jam uh, for a couple of weeks now. So that is a um, that is a um, the the epidemic um, in the country. So it's it's almost over. Um, what has not been over is the fact that the border are still closed. Um, so um, so it affects a lot. Um, um, a lot of people, although we don't see it um, very obviously, because everyday life seems to be back to normal, but because the border closed, um, the export um, has slowed down, also the importation, but the export has slowed down, and our economy is based on exportation. Um, we are, we are, um, um, we have a contract with a lot of companies, so seafood and clothes and shoes and, and rubber and coffee is supposed to go out, um, that everything slowed down now. Many industrial zone factory and company um, only work at the half of capacity or some company or factory even closed down. So the life of people are seriously affected. Um, people, the worker earn much less, um, they are much less job, um, much less income. So, um, so people's life, uh, in particularly the poor, the people who live hand to mouth um, are severely affected. 
Um, so, um, yeah, so the lockdown, during the lockdown, the, the people who, um, because we have a, the poorest people live, really live hand to mouth. They find money to eat every day for every meal. So the moment they stop working, they stop eating. Um, and most of them also stay in a rental place. So um, they can rent by day, by weeks or by month. So when you don't pay the rent, you are on the street. So um, yeah, so that is, um, the, it affects um, uh, severely, the most severely are the, are, are the vulnerable people and the poor people. Um, so as the sex worker, um, during the lockdown, um, you can imagine the sex worker don't have work. Um, the drug user are also severely affected because during the lockdown, it's much, much more difficult to buy drug and drug is much more expensive. Um, so they, um, they are, um, it's, it's really difficult for them. Um, and then the methadone patient, because they have to co-pay. Um, then when they don't have money to co-pay, um, they are, um, it's very challenging for them as well. So, um, so we see a lot of suffering during and after the COVID. People continue mm. to suffer. We, we continue to see people who, who don't have a food to eat and who don't have a place who cannot afford to pay the rent. Mm. Um, yeah. And when, can, can you share with us um, just some of the ways that, that SCDI and, and other organizations that you've been working with have been able to respond and uh, continue to respond? What, what, what has been your community response, particularly for these vulnerable groups that you've just mentioned? So we, um, we start uh, first by uh, making sure that um, the community worker, we have um, about 700 community worker who, uh, who work with us. Um, so they are not our staff, but they are, they are our outreach worker. We make sure that re they receive their monthly incentive um, because uh, we, um, so Vietnam, um, has been affected since long time because we have a long border with China. And you know that the, when the, the China, um, our first, the first cases that fell in Vietnam was in January. So about the same time as the epidemic erupted in China. So the country has been on alert since January. Um, uh, people start to lose job, restaurant close um, since January. So since January, we see that among our, our rich worker, people start losing job. Most of our, our rich worker have another job to earn their living. So our rich worker is only, um, is they do it on their, like as a part-time job. So the, the, the incentive that we pay them um, is only a one part of their income. But when we see that they, they are losing other job, the income that they have with us become the, the, the main, the only source of income. And because of the, um, of the slowdown and then the lockdown, we have, a, we have a not official lockdown, but the isolation and the government start to, um, uh, to restrict the movement since January. So because of that, that many of our project activity cannot be implemented. Um, but then we, um, we make the, and Donna was not really um, reacted by then. Um, so we made the decision that we pay our, our rich worker anyway even if they cannot do the work because of the travel restriction, we make sure that people get, get to eat. Um, and then we order protective equipment. We order hand sanitizer and masks from very early before the lockdown happened. Um, because we know that once the lockdown happened, if you don't have a mask, we cannot even go out. So, um, so we order masks and we send it to provinces to distribute to our, our rich worker and also our client from very early on. So it's actually is, um, mask and hand, hand sanitizer arrive before the lockdown. So that help people, at least they can move a little bit because with our mask, you, um, you would be, uh, you cannot move. Um, so pay people providing protective equipment, but then because we work very closely with the community, we start to um, get the report that 
uh, our client um, start to um, to experience a food shortage or there's a risk of, of starvation or, or being hunger um, so we um, we do some we did, we did some kind of um, very rapid assessment and we found the people who um, who fainted on the street because of being hunger so um, so we start to provide um, um, uh, we do a food um, distribution program for the homeless people um, and for the slum people living in slum in the in the poor area um, and we in fact we increase our activity during the lockdown because the lockdown means no restaurant no cafe nothing and so the homeless people will surely be hungry because there's they have they cannot they not only not only that they don't have money, but they don't have food. They cannot buy the food. So, um, so we increase the distribution of food. We, we find a lot more people on the street. And then we also increase the distribution of um, uh, a food package, rice and oil and, and egg and things, peanut, to the, to the slum. Um, yeah, and we do it through our volunteer, but also through our community network. Mm -hmm. um, so provide to the methadone patient, to the people living with HIV, to the sex worker. Um, so that, um, and as we do that, um, and we raise funds from individuals, so people contribute, mm. people contribute money, people contribute, uh, contribute food, um, we distribute um, thousands and thousands of uh, ready, the hot meal, and, and um, about, we, we distribute 35, 30, no, 36 ton of rice and, um, and, and other things and, uh, and, and salt you had, and, and must, yeah. You had a, a campaign that was called One Egg, One Egg Per Day. I saw that campaign, um, yeah. which was delivering food, in, it, food parcels that had um, an egg and had other, had masks in it. Can you just say, just, just describe that to us? We've lost your video. Yeah, so we um we have a um a kind of uh, informal charity fund called One Eggs a Day. It's really um to provide food nutrition to the poor people. So we run that campaign during the COVID during the lockdown, and ask people to donate. So people donate um people donate food people donate meal so like in hanoi we got like the donation of six thousand mil people some people just like donate um 100 mil a day um people donate eggs um it, it seems like one eggs a day is very simple and easy and so some people donate 1000 eggs some people donate 600 eggs so um and masks and hand sanitizer and soap and uh, cooking oils and rice and peanut mm -hmm. and and dry meat uh, etc so we um it's, it's, we run this campaign in 12 provinces and uh, people donate um um everywhere so people send money as well um so we um we managed to um to keep people um uh, fed during the during the lockdown and um and after that even and um but but the what we find interesting is that um, through this activity, we do not only serve the community that we usually uh, work with, drug users and sex worker and people living with HIV, but we come uh, closer. Um, we we interact we uh, with the the other vulnerable population, the homeless, the urban poor. Um, mm -hmm. um, and um, and we uh, now we expand actually we expand our uh, the popul our target population mm -hmm. and um, we we go deeper in there in uh, um, to understand their vulnerability um, and and based on that now we um, we go into the second phase that we call recovery and development um, beyond the food and the mass distribution. 
Mm, thank you so much, Juan. There is so much. I see somebody in the attendees box has also said there is so much to learn from Vietnam and um, I, can't, I can't echo that enough. So I think we will, I'm going to move along to Blessy and hopefully I can come back just for um, a final word from you. Um, so thank you, Juan. Um, and I'm going to move to you, Blessy, um, if I can, and just ask you, we had last week, we were very lucky to have Dr. Luchika from the Stop TB Partnership with us who outlined the situation um, in relation to TB. But could you tell us a little bit about the situation for communities who are of people who are affected by TB. How has COVID affected them? Thank you very much, Nadine. I'm um, really, really glad that TB is uh, part of the conversation around uh, COVID, um, and uh, I'm really delighted uh, to be speaking about TB that I'm extremely passionate about. Um, so, um, I'm with the Global Coalition of TB Activists, as uh, uh, Nadine already mentioned, and um, towards the end of March, towards the last week of uh, March when, um, you know, COVID started coming into um, different countries, into the news, countries contemplating lockdown, we did a very quick survey, uh, a global survey, and it was very interesting to see what the initial uh, responses were. We had about 18 countries who uh, responded, about five countries from Asia Pacific, Southeast Asia, about nine countries in Africa, and uh, we had a couple of countries in uh, Eastern Europe and Latin America. And because countries were all going into lockdown, um, and some had already gone into lockdown, like India, one of the major issues that was raised by the respondents was uh, the public transport had come to a standstill. So then how do you access um, health facilities for diagnostics, for treatment and other uh, services? Um, there was serious drug uh, shortages and uh, stockouts because uh, uh, flights were being canceled. Uh, so if you hadn't already, um, you know, put in your um, uh, request, uh, and um, if it had been done recently, then drugs coming into the countries was a huge uh, issue. OPDs were closed down, dot centers were closed. Um, so there were serious treatment uh, disruptions. And then um, uh, uh, things like um, rerouting of health staff that were managing TB um, health posts to COVID response. Uh, patients would go to the DOT centers and find uh, that there was nobody in the health center to uh, take care of them because everybody was so busy with COVID. Um, and then uh, some, because it was so early on, the issues of nutrition um, uh, didn't come up so much, very few, only about 7% of the respondents highlighted this as a, as a challenge. Um, but as we saw later on, a month into this, uh, migration, uh, hunger, um, uh, loss of um, earnings was a huge, huge issue. Um, so this, this, you know, this was how TB was really falling off the radar completely. Uh, because of COVID. Thanks, Blessy. Um, I'm just wondering if you could, could you say something about, I mean, your GCTA has a reach that is global. And I just wonder, have you already started, and particularly in the light of those challenges that you've outlined there, have you seen examples where communities have responded from different regions, different countries, even a few that you could share with us? I think we're learning so much today. Yes, thanks, Nadine. Um, so uh, for my, uh, to answer that question, I'm going to do it at different levels. Um, so the country, regional, and uh, the global level. So to give you an example, I'll take India. <laughs> um, justifiably, I'm based here. So India went into a complete lockdown without any warning. Um, and uh, uh, people were left with, um, you know, like the daily wage earners really suffered. They couldn't pay their rent. There was no earnings. They were being kicked out of their homes. Um, and uh, then people started wanting to go back to their uh, homes because these are all migrants coming from different states, coming to the metropolis like Mumbai, um, uh, Delhi, and uh, Calcutta, Punjab to work. And then they all want wanted to back, but there was no transport. So we heard horror stories of people attempting to walk 
hundreds of kilometers, 800, 1000 kilometers. And we saw pictures. I mean, it was covered by international news. So all of you would have seen. And the number of people who died on the way, many of them were also TB patients. We heard horror stories from hospitals where there was no uh, TB drugs that were reaching and about you know, 100 patients died, 120 patients died, prisons, um, uh, you know. So treatment interruption really was a huge issue. So as a community in India, we got together. We first wrote to the health minister. We wrote to the prime minister after that. And we highlighted the challenges. And we gathered information from our volunteers on the ground, um, you know, to ask them suggestions of how this can be addressed. So we were not just highlighting the problems, but we were also giving suggestions from the ground. Then we also wrote to our central TB division and we said, you know, dry, directly observed treatment doesn't work. You know, you cannot have them in the situation coming once a week or, you know, uh, twice a week is impossible. You need to issue them at least two months supply of drugs at a time. And from our side, our community volunteers will take on the responsibility of supporting them for adherence and other things. So that was a good thing. The Central TB Division actually sent out a letter to the uh, states and the districts to ensure that this happens. But we all know that a letter doesn't mean implementation on the ground. So again, the soldiers on the ground, the community volunteers, again, find out if this is really happening and highlighted the challenges for us to take back. Then we, uh, we know that from many countries like Kenya, we've heard, we've heard from Mozambique, we've heard from Cote d'Ivoire, uh, you know, where the community volunteers are actually supporting with follow up at the district health center level, primary health care center level, and also supporting and linking patients needing care and support, um, uh, you know, to volunteers, to peer support groups, just whatever we can. And initially it is uh, a very sort of an unorganized response to the desperate need. But we hope that this can become, uh, you know, formalized and this can become uh, the rule by which we all work. Then at the region... Can I just yeah. come in there? I just would love to, um, you know, I would love to hear from just the, the, the panelists, just as we come towards the end of the webinar, if I just asked you for a final, um, just, just give us a, um, a piece of, of advice from what you've learned from the community response of TB. What would it be for everybody? Just as quick as you can. Um, yeah, I, see, for me, in everything we do, strengthening the core is most important. So I think the community is the core of any disease response. They are the back do backbone, but seldom recognized. I mean, even from our panelists, we heard that for policies to be translated onto the ground and implemented, it is the community that can actually ensure that this happens. And communities are also our early warning system, you know, mm -hmm. of any challenges and interruptions, and they give us a real-time feedback. So I really would like to stress the importance of investing and building capacity of communities for a sustained um, a, a response to any, any problem. Thank you. Thank you, Blessy. That is really clear and super, uh, super wisdom. And we've also just put in the chat some resources that people can go to if they'd like to learn more about the community responses um, relating to TB. So I'd love to come back, if I can, to you, Nicola, and just to ask you um, just to give us a final, um, just, just to give, leave us with something in terms of community responses from your perspective, as quick as you can. Sure, I think we were just hearing about it, but I think from the community's perspective, there is obviously so much we can do. Um, but it can't work in isolation and, we, and we, from our experience we just have to partner with the health facilities, with social welfare to make sure that what we're planning and delivering is done in partnership so that we can be picking up on the issues from the clinic and vice versa that young people in need of additional support from the community can be referred back to the clinics and seen there. So it's a partnership. Well, thank you for showing what an example of partnership between the community and the health and the, the, the formal health system is like in Zimbabwe. And I hope people go and have a look at Jandiri and Africade's work to see more about that. Thank you, Nicola. Okay. Um, Florence, just coming to you back in Kenya, um, what would you leave us with from your experience? And you need to unmute yourself. Thank you, Florence.
Sorry. There you go. Yeah. Oh, you're muted again. Sorry, Florence. Ellen, can you unmute Florence? Sorry, there you go. sorry. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry about that. As an organization, we, uh, we believe in the power of communities working um, together. And um, in the words of uh, Kenya's uh, Cabinet Assistant Secretary, uh, Dr. Masi, she said, community is at the center of uh, gravity response. So as such, as an organization, we'll continue uh, in our efforts to strengthen our communities towards this end. Oh, thank you, Florence. Thank you so much for that. Um, and to you, Juan, for um, a last word before we close. Sorry. I'm just coming over to Juan back in Vietnam. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I think it's um, um, in terms of respond to like public health respond to COVID. I think we are uh, up to this. So the world will have a lot to learn and to share. But I think the COVID exposed the people who are most vulnerable in the society. So the, the, the vulnerable people would, would be vulnerable to, to anything and they would be the first who suffers not only from the health um, perspective, but uh, from everything else, from all other economic, uh, financial, um, such as safety and uh, security. So, um, so I think we, we need to um, keep a very close eye and working closely with the, with the most vulnerable uh, population and community in any circumstance, mm. particularly when the disaster like this happened, when you have a crisis, um, mm. think of the most vulnerable people. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you each and every one of you for making sure that we see how important the communities are in the response and how no matter what, no matter what the issue that we're dealing with, communities manage to find creative solutions and ways to inspire us all. So thank you so much. Um, Hala. Okay, thank you, Nadine. And also thank you to, to our speakers for sharing with us all those lessons about uh, community responses. A lot to learn from that. So, uh, and we hope also to, sh to host you in, our, in one of our coming webinars. So next week, week webinar will be about exploring a planetary health response to the pandemic. And the recording of this webinar will be available later. And as we are running over the time, I'm saying goodbye and thank you everyone. And see you next week. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, everybody.